this this morning. Amen. Um, you know, Pastor Jay has already invited you to open up your Bibles. So um, let's go ahead and let's let's get into it. So uh, we're going to turn our Bibles today to uh, the Book of Luke. The Book of Luke. Amen. Luke chapter twenty two. Now we are continuing our series on the miracle of Jesus. Amen. I'll give you a moment to get to it. Um, let's see, uh, Richard. Just so you know, um, if you just hit the down button on the next on the key, it should get you to the scripture. You can walk with me. Um, I'll be as I'm reading. I'll be reading from the um, Christian Standard Bible (CSB), but please follow along as your translation allows. Amen. All right. So, we, if you have it, say Amen. Amen, amen. Um, and it reads, and it says, while he was speaking, meaning this was Jesus speaking, um, suddenly a mob came and one, of his, and one of his twelve named Judas was leading them. He came near to Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Then, he, then those around him saw what was going to happen, and they asked, Lord, should we strike with a sword? Then one of them struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. But Jesus responded, no more of this, and touched his ear, and he healed him. And then Jesus said to the chief priests, temple police, and the elders who had come from him, have you come out with swords and clubs if I, as if I was a criminal? Every day while I was with you in, in the temple, you never laid a hand on me, but this is your, but this is your hour in the dominion of darkness. Amen. And if you will, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Father God in heaven, we thank you, God, for this moment. God, I pray, God, that, um, I, that you use me, God, as a conduit. God, not only to hear the words of this sermon myself, but God, for anybody who needs to hear what I have to say. God, I pray that you would cleanse me as a as a messenger, God, and that you would um, allow the people, God, to hear your word um, via my voice. And God, for all things that we do, we pray that you would give you praise, the Lord, for what you're going to do in this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Um, and so as a topic today, um, I have a really simple um, encouragement for all of us. And that encouragement is simply, he can handle it. He can handle it. He can handle it. You know, when, when I talk about the idea of it, you may ask the question, what is it? Well, I have to tell you that, honestly, it is whatever's on your mind at the moment. You see, when we all come into church, we come into church with, we don't just, I mean, we come to praise the Lord, amen, right? Amen, amen we do. But we also come with burdens, thoughts, concerns, Challenges, things that sit heavy on our mind, don't we? Amen. And so, it's that thing that keeps you up at night. It keeps you up at night. It keeps you on your knees. Amen. It wakes you up. It makes you go to sleep. It makes you mad. It makes you complex and confused. It makes you wonder, what are you going to do? Well, today I want to come to give you a very simple encouragement that for the it that bothers you, remember that Jesus can handle it. Yeah. Jesus can handle it. And you wonder, and, and the thing is, when we come to church, we hope that Jesus will be able to solve our problems and help us. But sometimes when we do that, we fail to understand how powerful God really is. Amen. We come looking for answers, and sometimes it's hitting us dead in the face, but yet we choose not to trust what's going on. And so in today's story, I want to show you a very unlikely miracle. In fact, it's a miracle at the point, it's a miracle that's happening at Jesus' most stressful, and anxious, and difficult, and dangerous point of his life. Jesus is about to be betrayed by somebody he loves. Love. Amen. Love. He's about to go to the cross. This is the last miracle he's making before he goes to the cross. 
Although it doesn't appear in every gospel, it is specifically recorded in Luke. Although his betrayal is recorded in every gospel, the only one that makes mention of this miracle is in the book of Luke. And so as Jesus is going along, Jesus is being confronted by somebody that he loved very much. And this person is sit, sits here, and that person decides to betray Jesus. Well, in the midst of his entire moments, Jesus throughout this part of the story helps us to understand that even in the darkest, dangerous, most stressful moments of our lives, he can handle it. Whatever that is, he can handle it. And just in case you're wondering a few of those examples, I want to take you through this story and help you understand some of the things that he can handle. If you go back and look at verse um, 47 and 48, it says that while he was still speaking, suddenly a mob came up, and one of the twelve named Judas was leading, I mean, was leading them. One well, of the first things I want to tell you is that not only can Jesus handle it, but Jesus can handle your enemies. Jesus can handle your enemies. Now, when we used to think of enemies, we think of the people who hate us, don't we? We always think about the people who we think can't stand us when they see us coming, talk down on us, treat us a certain way, right? But I'm, but I'm here to tell you that today, you may have missed a few enemies in your life that you haven't paid attention to. You see, Judas used, when Judas came to Jesus, and this is not in this particular story, but, well, it's, it's, it's glanced over, but it's not as, um, but it's not as prominent as in other parts of the gospel. But Judas now, who had walked with Jesus, ate with Jesus, talked with Jesus, served with Jesus, shows up with a band of men. Now, by all accounts, as much as we can understand, when we think about this story, we think about something like the Passion of Christ, where we think that maybe there was about, let's say, 20 million, right? But the reality is, it probably was a few hundred men who showed up to take Jesus into custody. And they're being led by somebody who Jesus walked with, talked with, teach, love, prayed for, ate with, suffered suffer with, and yet God is in this, I mean, that Jesus is in this place, where he is being betrayed by somebody he cares about. And not only that, the person who he spent this time with comes towards him and betrays him with a simple kiss. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we know that a kiss is an act of intimacy. A kiss is an act of love, right? Yeah. And yet this person treats him with this act of love, and yet he meant him no good. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. So I'm here to tell you that sometimes the enemies in our life are not just the people who hate us. Sometimes the enemies are the people who are in our lives, let me, put it in, let me put it in a really simple way. Sometimes enemies are people in our life who don't love us, but they love what we do for them. Amen. Now see, I want to get real, real, I want to get real, 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 real deep with this one. You see, sometimes there are people that you are hanging with simply because of what you do for them. Right. Not because they like you or love you. Amen. Amen. And not only that, those are some of the people who mean you the worst. Those are some of the people who at the first drop of a dime will betray you. And yet you go hang out with them. You call them all the time and tell them your business. You loan them money. You give them things with no expect of them giving anything back. They always take from you and they never give you anything, and yet you call them friends. You see, someone who's an enemy is somebody who means you no, no care but all harm. Yeah. Amen. Let me, so let me, let me go even deeper. If you, if you are going out with people, and y'all are making a pact that, that whatever we do stays within this group, that's your enemy. Yeah, I know I'm going to get in on that one. I know I'm going to get in on that one. But I just want to tell you, those people who you, those people who go out with you and they encourage you to get out of pocket, those are your enemies. I, oh, don't worry. I ain't going to tell nobody. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. That's your enemy. Because guess what? In the end of the day, do you come out better? Do they pull you closer to God? 
Bingo, that's your enemy. If they are encouraging you to go out on Saturday night and do stuff that you got to come to the altar and repent for in the morning, that's your enemy. Amen. You see, we can, the worst that we can do in our life is we can confuse our friends and our enemies. We will give all our enemies the time of day and make our friends and make our friends beg for our time. Your friend will tell you what was right, and you will tell them that, hey, I, we, I ain't doing that. That's wrong. I don't feel like doing that. I just feel like I should be better. I just feel like I could do, do something different, right? Well, Jesus tells us that those people are your enemies, and that's how Judas treated Jesus. He pretended to be a friend, and in reality, he was an enemy. But Jesus can handle them. But Jesus can handle them. Let me tell you how Jesus handled them. Remember, Jesus shows up in the garden, 500 people deep. I mean, Jesus, Judas shows up in the garden, 500 people deep, don't he? And when he shows up, Jesus asks a simple question, Judas, are you betraying me with a kiss? So when I say that Jesus can handle it, let me show you how Jesus handles your enemies. Jesus exposes your enemies. Jesus exposes your enemies. So what that means is, Jesus allowed Judas to put himself in a place where he had to choose between two things he said he loved. Remember now, if you know the other part of the story, Judas betrayed Jesus for how much money? 30, 30 pieces of silver, right? So that means that when, G when Judas had a chance to go, I can save Jesus, or I can take the money. What did he do? He took the money. And guess what? The enemies in your life will expose themselves to you. But you got a choice to make when they do. You have a choice to make. Will I continue to treat them like friends or will I treat them like their enemies? Because the worst thing you can do is confuse your friends and your enemies. If Jesus can handle your enemies, Jesus can handle it. Verse 49. As we keep walking in this story, we see that Judas, uh, with this band of 500 men, are walking, are walking up to Jesus to take him to be, to be wrongfully uh, put on trial. And as he's doing that, the disciples are in a bind. They're in a, very, they're in a big confusion because, keep in mind, they're about, they know that this is going to be a fight. They know it. Think about it. If you're, if you're sitting in the midst of dark and 500 people show up and surround you, your first thought is not how we're going to pray. Your thought is how we getting out of here right now. Right? How are we going to get out of here? And they even look at Jesus. They say, Jesus, so is this the time when we draw swords? Is this it? Is this the time when we need to get up and we need, we need to start throwing things? Is this it? Right? And Jesus hadn't given an answer yet. But man, oh man, there is one person who's already decided he going to do. Yeah. Amen. There's already one person who's decided what he going to do. Now, when we read the story in Luke, it doesn't tell us who this person is. But when we read Matthew and John, and Ma I mean, in Matthew, John, and gosh, what's the other gospel? Mark, yeah. We find out that that man is Peter. Surprise, surprise, right? Surprise, surprise. Peter is swinging swords. Surprise, Peter's saying stuff he ain't got no thing to say, right? And so the idea here is that when the disciples are waiting on Jesus to give them the next instruction, Peter said, man, I don't need no instruction. I know what I'm about to do, right? Yeah, he said, I'm about to pull, I'm about to pull this up, and we're about to get down, right? The, the disciples are in a place where they're wondering what they're going to do next. And the reason why they're wondering what they're going to do next is because they're afraid. Yeah. If Jesus can handle it, Jesus can handle your enemies. Right. If Jesus can handle your enemies, Jesus can handle your fears. Right. Jesus can handle your fears. You see, fear is a very natural reaction response to our lives, isn't it? There are just things that happen that scare us, don't they? But understand that when we get introduced to fear repetitively and constantly, it begins to do something to our bodies. It begins to do 
strange and difficult things to our bodies. You see, there are physical effects to fear. Physical effects to fear. It affects our physical health. It can weaken our immune system if, we, if we're always worried and fearful. It can cause heart issues if we're always afraid and fearful. It can cause stomach issues if we're always afraid and fearful. It can even make us move faster in aging and move faster towards death. You see, fear is something that we have to learn that it is a natural response, but we have to learn how to control our fear. You see, there are these things in our lives that when we and we ask questions like, how are we going to do it? What's it going to do to me? How am I going to get through it? And all these things are things that Jesus knows you have questions about. But we have to learn how to deal with fear because it will hurt our physical health. Not only that, it will affect your brain. It makes it hard for us to remember things. It can affect our brain process. And when you're afraid, there's something in our bodies that when you are afraid, there are other parts of your body that shuts down because you're focused in on what you fear. You're focused in on what you fear. And not only that, it can cause a drain on your mental health. How many of you have been so stressed that you're just tired? Amen. You're just so stressed at thinking about that one thing or those two things or everything coming together that you just go, man, I give up. I can't do this no more. I, I wish it would go away, but I can't do anything with it. Jesus tells us, or the, no, our bodies keep a score of what fear can do to us. But if fear is not regulated, it could become the death of us, and it could make us make bad decisions, just like Peter did. You see, because Peter was afraid, and make no mistake about it, there will be times in your life when you will be afraid. Amen. Amen. Now here's the thing. You ain't got to admit that to me. Okay? You ain't got to sit me down and say, Reggie, I'm scared. But let me tell you something. You better admit it to yourself. Right. You better tell yourself when you are brave. You see, some of us go around and we try to look brave, act brave, you know, play brave, when inside we are dying. Amen. We are scared. We're, when we go in a room and cry, right. We have all these worries pent up, and we know that we won't tell anybody because we got to keep the brave face on. But here's the thing the more you keep it on the inside and you don't admit it, the more likely you are to make bad decisions. You see, because again, when you have fear in your heart, when you have fear in your body, you don't think straight. You don't think straight. You're thinking about survival, and it, that means that whatever I have to do to get out of it, I'm willing to do because I don't want this anymore. And that's when we make some bad decisions, folks. Yeah. Look at Peter. In the midst of 500 men, he says, you know what? Well, I'm just going to draw my sword and we're going to get down. Let me say it again. There were 500 men. 500. Peter made a mistake. Or, I'm sorry, Peter made a decision based on his emotions. How many of us have made decisions based on our emotions? Amen. Good Lord. How many of us have done that? And I don't want you to feel lost like me, not me. So let me, so let me, let me give you a list of a few, okay? How many of you have ever made a decision based on emotions simply because you were mad at somebody? Amen. Huh? <clears throat> Your whole thought process is like, I'm mad and I need you to be, I need you to understand how I feel so I'm going to hurt you. Right? Maybe you were, maybe you made a decision based on emotions simply because you were attracted to someone. Yeah, I like how you look, so I'm about to make a decision, no matter what it costs me. Amen. Simply because you're afraid of something or someone. It'll mess you up, won't it? Simply because you're too prideful to ask for help. How many of us make decisions like that? Now, I can't go by for help because people come to me for help. And then you make a bad decision when you need some help. Amen? And here's to be one of the worst ones of all. Or maybe you were like the disciples. They were sitting there. They, they didn't have any swords out. They didn't know what to do. And they didn't make a decision at all. Amen. They didn't make a decision at all. They were paralyzed by analysis. I could do this, I could do that, I'm not sure to do. Lord, what should I do, right? But here is the reality of where we are. When we get stuck and 
when we have fears, Jesus can handle our fears. He can handle it. He can handle it. How does he handle it? Let's look at the word of God. In this particular story, and it's not written, it is, it is not in what we read today, but if you jump back up to verse 35 in chapter 20, I mean, in chapter 22, you'll see that before they got into this, before they got into trouble, Jesus told them, hey, trouble's coming. And not only is trouble coming, you need to be ready. You need to be ready because it's coming, right? You need to be ready. And not only that, he says, listen, when I sent you out, I'm not going to go back and read it, but I'm just going to trust that it's going to be on the screen, or I'm going to just read it, I'm going to just call it out to you. But here's what he says in short. As he was sitting around the table with the disciples, he said, he said, disciples, can I ask you a question? When I sent y'all out two by two, you ain't have no money, you ain't have no sandals, you ain't have no clothes, did you lack anything? And they said, we lack nothing. And so Jesus called to their mind his word. Jesus recalled that when they, when he sent them out with nothing, they had everything. Jesus beats our fears with his word. So if you're not, if you're not hearing and listening to Jesus' words, you, you will have more fear. Let me say it a different way. How many of y'all familiar with Kevin Hart? Raise your hand if you know who Kevin Hart is, right? Famous comedian, right? Um, one time on an interview with Oprah Winfrey, he told this story about the time that before he became the big, the big name comedian he was today, he talked about how he struggled from week to week and from month to month trying to make ends meet. And so one of the things that he really struggled with was how to pay his rent. Well, thankfully, he had a mother who loved him very dearly and would do all she could to help him. Well, one, well this one particular time, he had gone too far and he had asked for too much money, and yet he came to his mom and said, Mama, listen, it's another struggle of month. I got a few kids, but I really need some help to rent this month. And so when he came to his mom and asked him that, his mama said, baby, did you read your Bible? And he said, no, mom, I didn't read my Bible. He said, okay, baby, just go read your Bible, right? And so he leaves, and he goes on and goes through some, a whole bunch of other stuff. He's still struggling, trying to, trying to figure out how to make it, right? Well, then the next month, he's doing a lot of, trying to do a lot of work. But he's still not making enough money to cover his rent. And so he comes back to his mom. He says, Mom, listen, things are tough. It's tight. I can't make it. I'm going to need some help with the rent this month because I'm behind. And so his mama comes to him and he says, Baby, did you read your Bible? And he said, Mom, listen, Mom, I, I, listen, I really need it because I'm behind. I'm worried I'm going to get kicked out. I need some help right now. And he said, Baby, you need to go read your Bible. And so he leaves, and he goes off, and he goes to go try to figure out some other stuff to try to make it work, right? Well, again, he comes back, and he says, Mama, listen, again, Mama, I, 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 listen, I'm like, day, I'm like days from getting kicked out of my place. I need the rent, and I need it now. And Mama says to him again, baby, did you read your Bible? And he says, now, now Mama, I'm on the edge here. I got a lot going on. I can't take this no more. I'm about to get kicked out. It's already hard. Baby, did you read your Bible? He said, no. He said, well, I need you to go home and read your Bible. Well, finally that day, after being turned down by his mama, he went home and he read his Bible. And what he didn't know was that tucked in the middle of his Bible was the rent money that he needed to make it through all those months he had asked for. All right. The problem was that he just didn't read his Bible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How many of us are looking for situations to be better and we just won't read our Bible? Amen. God's word gives us assurance after assurance that if we read it, if we live it, if we trust it, Amen. it will Amen. make us better. It will give us what we need so that we're able to survive. Amen. But we don't read it. We don't read it. If we would just simply read his word, then Jesus can handle our fears. Amen. Amen. Oh man, I have so much more to say, but I'm gonna, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm call it. No, I can't. I'm gonna, <laughs> you know, it's the time. I have so much more to say. I, I'm gonna let me end with this and, and listen. Um, I got a feeling we'll be preaching second service. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. See. So if you stay around for another couple of hours, you get dressed. See. Um, but long story short. 
and man, it's, it really, let me, let me just, yeah, let me get to this. I'll just say that again here. Um, you see, there's two different ways we can handle the problem, right? We can handle our problems and we can let Jesus handle our problems. Amen. Amen. You know, I have an iPhone, right? Now, I feel like I'm a pretty uh, savvy guy when it comes to technology, right? And I could probably do my best to try to fix a phone, but you know what? I would feel a lot more comfortable if the person who invented the phone fixed my phone, right? Because they made it. They know what's wrong. They know how they they know how it's intricately wired and how everything is connected and how it can be fixed, right? Well, we have here's the issue. A lot of times we try to we try to hold on to the problem, and then when we get into one of the problem, we say, Jesus, I don't want you to hold on with us. But if, if both of us are holding on to it, who gonna fix it? Are y'all following me? No. Y'all follow me? You see, for us to really solve our problems, we have to learn that we can try to fix it, or Jesus can fix it. Yeah. And I guarantee you, the inventor of the, and the creator and the savior of the universe knows how to fix the problem better than me because he made the world, he made everything. Right. Amen. 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 You see, we need to have the same attitude when it comes to our problems, that when we face it, we need to remember that Jesus should not be the last option amongst all the other things that we can do. Listen, Google is good. I love Googling a good problem. I love reading a good manual to figure out a problem, right? But ultimately, I need to be willing to give my problem to the one who I know can solve my problem. Because here's the thing. If he can handle my fears, if he can handle my fears, if he can handle my enemies, he can handle anything. Amen. But you gotta let him handle it. Amen. Father God in heaven, I thank you for this day, God. I thank you for the opportunity to ever speak. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would um, just have spoken to our hearts, God, even especially to me, Lord. Remind me, God, that remind us all, Lord, that in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of all of our pain, God, our issue should not be that we try to solve our problem, then we come to you. That we should live before you first, God, so that you can give us all that we need to solve it. And so, God we, we, God, we praise you that, God, you're all-powerful, that you're all-knowing, God. You know what ails us. You know what makes us, you know what keeps us up at night. And, God, you can solve what we have to give it to you. And, God, my prayer, Lord, is that as we give it to you, God, that we will give it to you and we will relinquish that, Lord, never to pick it up again. Because, God, we know that once you've solved it, it is done. It is finished. It is complete. And it is done in totality. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us stand. Let us stand. So if you're here today, and you know it is bugging you, I'm asking you to bring 